Good evening. It's Saturday, May 13th. My name is Dave Coker, and this is Talking About Finance. And guys, this is awesome. It's another opportunity to chat with you all, to talk about the most fascinating topic in finance, how to build wealth. And we know many things about the process. We know it's easy. We know it takes time. We know it is very rewarding. We know we have to invest, and we know we can't trade. And we also know the greater majority of people have little to no patience. And so they fail. They fail to build what we would consider significant, life-changing wealth. What we believe in isn't some dark, hidden art. Rather, it's there right in front of us. It's always been there. But many choose to ignore these lessons. And because of this, they'll never gain what is rightfully theirs. The right to live without the fear of debt. The right to live without the fear of being broke. The right to live without the fear of being able to provide for your needs, let alone your wants. This right is denied to the majority who choose to ignore this simple system. And instead they overthink. They're always looking for something that isn't there. A system or solution, or even a guru, that just doesn't exist. Instead we use a system, a solution, that's been used throughout history. The power of compound interest over a long period of time. We control our spending. We maximize our investments. We're always seeking to increase cash flow with every decision we take. This cash flow can be used for further investing. And we have one simple request of any assets we purchase. They must generate cash flow. So let's keep this goal in mind tonight as we talk about finance. The S&P closed down this week about 29 basis points. Three sectors outperformed the S&P 500. Communication services, consumer discretionary, and consumer staples. No consumer staples lost on the week, but it still did better than the S&P 500. Eight sectors underperformed, specifically utilities, information technology, real estate, industrials, healthcare, financials, materials, and energy. So stocks are sort of sliding. Earnings have been better than expected, but it looks like Washington's going to deadlock over the debt. And that's got markets concerned. The VIX traded down to 17.03 and opened the week at 17.19. More odd behavior from the VIX. And you know, guys, I'm getting a bad feeling about the markets lately. Fed is committed to 2% inflation, but we're tracking much higher than that. Rates are rising, but fixed income markets suggest they're going to fall. And at the same time, corporate earnings are slowing. We're seeing an S&P 500 trading at a price to earnings ratio of 23.87. Compare that to a mean over the long horizon of 16.01. I'm getting concerned. The 10 year note closed the week at 3.47. It's flat week on week, down four tenths of 1% or 40 basis points year to date. Oil closed the week at 70.01 down about 1.7% on the week and down about 12.7% year to date. And since yesterday was Friday and in response to many PMs, yes, 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 I did buy Bitcoin and I did buy Ripple. Guys, you guys will know, longtime listeners are aware, I've been buying Rip Bitcoin every Friday for several years. I've been buying Ripple for about 14 months now and buying means regularly every Friday. I've got no plans to change. I'm old and fixed in my ways. But enough about me. Let's take a look at what me and my buddies were talking about all last week. An excellent week, lots of signal, little noise. We vibe together, which is probably why we all hang out on the same Telegram channel talking about finance 24-7. We are Global Wall Street. And on that Telegram channel, we know everyone on Wall Street. Everyone in the city of London, or we know someone who knows someone. 
We're everywhere else that matters. Every financial district we've got representation in. So this is your opportunity to pick up the gossip, to see what's going on, to see some of the stuff I like. And I'm sure you'll like it too. Why? Everyone loves cash flow. Everyone loves getting paid. Am I right? So let's go. Seven slides for seven days. And we'll start out this evening by taking a look at something in the UK that's called an offset mortgage. Very interesting financial product and a lot of people on the channel were puzzled. Here's how it works. If you've got a bunch of capital and it's dormant, you can actually use that to offset the principal on your mortgage. So that will lower your overall payment. Why? Because the amount of money you effectively borrowed has been lowered. They're interesting financial products. Unfortunately, I only bring this up and I, I was talking a lot on the channel about it because when's the last time we saw these? Right before the global financial crisis. Oh, oh, oh. And what else are they bringing back in the UK? 100% mortgages. When did we last see them? Yeah, you know by now, right before the global financial crisis. So this is why, another reason why, I'm getting a really odd feeling about the markets overall. A lot of the stuff we saw in the run up to 2000, 2008 is coming back. It's coming back bigger and better than ever, bigger and worse than ever, I should say. So yeah, it's got me a little bit of worried about, about what's going on. And we talked about the debt default, or run the debt deadlock in Washington. And this is interesting. Now, I, I haven't corroborated all these numbers, but I can certainly talk about 1969. And without a doubt, guys, I'm not old enough to talk about 1931. <laughs> but without a doubt, guys, in 69, yeah, the, 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 the effect of, pardon me, the, uh, in 71, the U.S. did default on the debt, and this was preceded by stocks and bonds both falling in 69. Now, this gentleman or, or a young lady, I'm not sure um, who it is, uh, they actually said this is a pattern, 31, 69, and 2002. We all know that both stocks and bonds fell in 2002, and if this cycle is correct, this indicator is, is true, then we should see a, a U.S. debt default. Uh, maybe in about 12 months. I, I don't know. It's it's interesting to take a look at this to see how it works. But yeah, the U.S. did default in 71. It wasn't a hard default. It was a technical default. And what happened was uh, there were some T-bills that came due. And because the U.S. was having a, a in a debt argument at the time, government debt debt uh, debt lock at the time, what happened was they didn't repay the the, the T-bills when they were supposed to. They were actually five days late. But guys, in banking, that's what we call a technical default. You're supposed to pay it on the first of the month, you pay it on the sixth of the month, you have defaulted. And sure enough, the US did default back then. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Of course, the driver of all this consternation, all this, this garbage going on in Washington right now, this dispute between the two sides, the Democrats want to increase the debt limit. The Republicans want to hold it the same or even cause it to fall. And the reason is that in the states, much like many people, they've got a budget, but they ignore it. And they just keep spending. And it's absolutely incredible how much money the U.S. spends compared to how much taxes they collect. Every quarter, they collect a record amount of taxes. And every quarter, the spending goes up. Personally, guys, I don't live with any debt, and I run a strict budget, and a lot of my friends give me a hard time about that. <laughs> I don't care, right? I run a strict budget. Yeah, you need to have a budget, whether you're a person, uh, you know, a family, or you're running a nation. You absolutely need a budget, and if you can't adhere to a budget, it's the same as if you didn't have a budget. So there's a problem there. And yeah, we're kind of looking, I'm getting this bad vibe, and I hate to keep talking about it, because I know you all go and blame it on me, aren't you? But yeah, we might be seeing a, a sharp crash, and I've written some articles on Medium, and it's been in my research notes that I sell banks, and more of the stuff will come out uh, in the public domain on Medium uh, over the next few days, if not weeks. But yeah, yeah, we're seeing lots of signs that there's going to be a very sharp correction slash crash in U.S. stocks. And this is a good one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not that I ever lost half my money to a divorce, but yeah, uh, you, a crash is worse because when 
stocks crash, you lose half your money, and yep, she's still downstairs yelling at you. What the hell are you doing up there? <laughs> so we'll have to see. And this is something that people don't really seem to understand, right? Got bull markets and bear markets. And yeah, I can read the, the, the captions as well as you. Prices rise, investors can't keep up. Yeah, there's a mania. On the bear side, prices fall, and investors can't get out of the way. They can't sell quick enough. Yeah, there's a mania in the reverse direction. The key takeaway here, guys, is it doesn't have to be like this. If you just do what I do and what many of my friends do, invest only for cash flow, buy only dividend-paying assets, then your market movements are irrelevant. You're insensitive. You don't really care whether the market's going up or whether the market's going down. And I do talk about this a fair amount when I bring up Bitcoin. Because as I've said to you guys before, buying Bitcoin every week, since every Friday, since 2014, I don't really pay attention to the price. I just know from week to week, I know exactly what I buy every week, or at least what I bought the last week. And when I buy next week, I will know whether Bitcoin went up or Bitcoin went down, because when I see how many coins I get, that's when I'll know. I, I don't care, though, about a bull market in Bitcoin. I don't care about a bear market in Bitcoin. I just buy. And the same thing applies to the stock market, guys. We talked about this before, and it's in, in some of my uh, research notes, without a doubt, and medium writing. You know, we have an expression on Wall Street, the game is rigged. The game is rigged to the upside. You look at the long-run history of stocks, they go up, up, up. Doesn't mean they go up every year. But over a decade, over two decades, over a sufficiently long horizon, a working lifetime, stocks indisputably go up. So just buy. Don't even pay attention to this bull bear garbage. And I say that as someone who's deeply plugged into the markets and just talks and thinks about finance pretty much 24-7. Don't pay attention to any of that garbage. And this is an interesting one. Getting a lot of press these days. Uh, you know, people always have these hierarchies. I don't quite get it, but I guess I would say that because I've been buying Bitcoin forever. <laughs> right? But the point is, uh, somebody people are really curious about how much Bitcoin you have to hold to be in the top X percent of holders. Top 5%, if you own more than 0.251 Bitcoin, you're in the top 5%. Top 2.5% greater than 2.5 Bitcoin. To be in the top 1%, you mean need more than 4.7 Bitcoin. More than 10.8 to be in the top one half of 1%. And a one-tenth of one percenter has over 31 Bitcoin. Yeah, interesting experiment, isn't it? Really fascinating to think about. But regardless, guys, when we buy, we're not going to sell. Yeah, I've been buying Bitcoin for years. I like to tell people that I've never sold, but technically that's true. I've done four small transactions. The last time Bitcoin, or I should say when Bitcoin tracked above $60,000, I was concerned because given the amount of coins I had, it was distorting my entire portfolio, meaning my stocks, investments, my IRA, uh, just everything. It was really starting to get beefy. And I was thinking, you know, at the time I was looking at property, I'm always looking at property, I saw some very good deals and I was thinking, you know, I could unload some Bitcoin, buy a rental property, and life goes on. So I did four small transactions, only about a couple grand, not, nothing much. And I just tested the, the pipes, so to speak. I tested from the exchange that I decided to use to sell Bitcoin. I tested to make sure that it worked, and it worked, and that's fine. But regardless, I, I don't buy, I don't spend Bitcoin. I don't buy it to spend it. I buy it to stack it. We talk about stacking in the bullion space. We talk about it in the cryptocurrency space. Stacking sats, it's called. I'm just going to continue to buy Bitcoin and hold on to it. When am I going to sell? Never. Never, never, never. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Been talking about finance. My name is Dave Coker. Look ahead to the week coming up. It's going to be awesome. Put some money in the market. Put some money into crypto. Make sure you got some gold and silver there. Rock and roll. It's a lot of fun, isn't it? Take care. Oh, the tunes are good tonight.